Hey, hello, and welcome to the podcast, 10 Lessons It Took Me 50 Years to Learn, where we talk to inspirational leaders from all over the world to dispense wisdom for life, business, and career in order to provide you shortcuts to excellence. My name is Jeffrey Wang, the founder of the Professional Development Forum and your host today. This podcast is sponsored by the Professional Development Forum, which helps diverse young professionals of any age find fulfillment in the modern workplace. Today, we're joined by Ben Yeo. Ben Yeo was born in Malaysia, educated in England and Canada, and has worked in many countries. After studying engineering at the University of Birmingham in 1981, his professional career started in Anderson Consulting. He then co-founded an IT company in Malaysia before migrating to Australia in 1987. Over the next 20 years, he held senior executive roles in several IT and telecom companies, including Tandem Computers, Computer Pal Group, and Motorola. In 2007, he resigned as CEO of Reach Global Services in Hong Kong to pursue theological studies at Regent College in Canada. This led to 12 years of ministry service, helping beggars in India, promoting Christian media, and broadcasting in Asia Pac, and leading World Vision in East Asia, the Middle East, and Eastern Europe. Today, he volunteers in charities and not-for-profit organization in Australia, serving as non-executive director of Excelsior College and Help the Persecuted. Bang has two master's degrees, management and theological studies, and a PhD in engineering. He now lives in Sydney with his wife, and together they have two married children and five grandchildren. Welcome to the show, Bang. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, Jeff. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, able to talk to you. Well, let's just jump straight into it then. Lesson number one, begin by envisioning the end. I remember nearly 30 years ago, I came across this book written by Stephen Covey, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And I could relate to everything that he wrote. It really seemed to be wise words of advice and, and really made good sense. And, and number two of his seven habits was to begin with the end in mind. That really has shaped a lot of my leadership experience after I came across the, this invaluable book. It, it helps when you're starting out to have some idea or, or to be able to imagine what it would be like at the end. You know, hopefully it's a better outcome, uh, a better future. It really helps to focus your energies on your personal efforts and the energies and efforts of your team towards realizing it. I'm really talking about vision casting in a sense. Uh, and I'm also talking about goal setting, uh, because usually goals are defined as outcomes or results at the end of the day. So having that clear view of the destination helps you to plan the journey. And I suppose this applies not only to the job or leadership role, but also to personal development as well. Um, in addition to that, it also helps you to think about succession planning because in leadership, nothing goes on forever. I found it very helpful to be able to identify and, and, and to proactively with intentionality, uh, identify potential successes right from the beginning and invest in them. Because when, when you hand over, you, you want to hand over something that is sustainable, an organization that continues to thrive. And that depends a lot on its leadership. So it takes time to develop leaders. And so there's a benefit of identifying ahead of time, the potential successes so that you can gradually give them the opportunity to take responsibility whenever you're unavailable. You know, sometimes you can plan to be unavailable so that they can take the opportunity to develop because there's nothing like learning on the job. And the third idea that comes out of this, when you can visualize uh, a, a better future, a better outcome, it helps to inspire hope. And then hope motivates the action and energizes the team as well. When there's a pressure to look inwards and, and really get discouraged by just the problem you, you face in front of you or the crisis. And that brings to mind a lesson that I learned from a wise leader that I, I used to work for many years ago. And he told me that uh, the leader must always be optimistic about the future. And he used the analogy of a military uh, campaign. In the in middle of a battle, if you look worried or deflated or defeated, uh, the troops will, will be worried and they will run away before the battle even begins. So you've got to keep 
looking uh, confident and optimistic and, and hopeful. And of course, my, my personal faith in God uh, informs and helps me tremendously in this matter. Wise King Solomon said that God has made everything beautiful in its time. And, and that's also because God has put eternity in our human hearts. And there's a lovely promise in that statement that our divine creator has placed in us a sense of eternity that there is something much more than our, you know, life in this transient world. And even when we can't see through our current problem, that hope of the, a better future keeps us going, you know, and that's uh, a really very, very powerful thought. I like that point about how a leader needs to inspire hope. And, and you mentioned that you, you have hope because you have some belief, you know. So my question to you is, can good leadership exist if the leader himself or herself don't have that hope? So if a leader goes and paints a picture that himself or herself don't believe in, can they still be a good leader? Well, I'm not that person, I'm afraid. I'm, I'm kind of a... <laughs> A compulsive optimist. There has to be some sincerity in this though, because you can't just simply fake it, you know, because people will see through it. You know, you, you have to be authentic in the way that you look at life and the way you look at things. Circumstances can be sometimes very discouraging and discouragement is uh, one of the biggest obstacles to apathy and inaction and, and, and failure. You need to look beyond that and try to lead people beyond that so that they can pick up themselves from the floor and, and get on with the job. And, and so that kind of leads me to a lesson that I learned so many years ago. I mean, that was nearly 40 years ago, and that's a scary thought in its own. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was in the UK, I was completing my PhD, my postgraduate studies in the UK it was actually funded by a company that I worked for in the automotive industry. So I was working as this young project engineer. I had a couple of projects that I was responsible for in the manufacturing uh, technology department. And uh, one of the projects that I was running really went badly wrong. Uh, it was a costly mistake that I had made. I, I, I didn't know what to do, except that I, I felt, look, you know, why don't you be proactive and apologize? And I, so I went to my, I went to my manager's manager. And his name was John Wilson. He was our group manager. I sheepishly ran into his office and I said, John, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. I made this stupid mistake. And, um, and I was really looking down. I mean, we talk about discouragement, right? Like I was really down and he said something that would impact my entire leadership life after that. He said to me, Ben, he looked me in the eye and he said this, show me someone who has never made a mistake and I will show you someone who has never done anything. And his words were just so redemptive. It was so uplifting. Just what I needed to hear at that time. And it helped me a great deal. And, and that's also part of my leadership lesson. You know, sometimes as leaders, if you can speak words of encouragement like that, you can lift people up from their despair. It, it taught me a very important lesson for the rest of my life that I would never be afraid of make, making mistakes again. But John also said something else after that. He said, just don't repeat the mistake. <laughs> Make sure you learn from it. All right. So I, I now begin to see that every mistake is a learning opportunity. You know, th these are the kind of lessons that you can learn in university. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, we should not let mistakes stop us from being decisive. My point here is that as leaders, we need to be decisive. Dithering has costly consequences as well. You know, no decision is a decision by default. So leaders need to be decisive because other people depend on our decisions. So we need to make decisions to move forward. So fear of failure sometimes can really stop us from trying new ideas. It can be a big obstacle. It leads to procrastination, missed opportunities. So I, in my optimistic self, I try to then look beyond that and, and say, look, don't let this failure get us down. We can learn from our mistakes and we can move on. You know, let's use this learning opportunity. And in, in, in a lot of my leadership life now, I've really learned to, about the value of after action reviews, you know, post-mortems. Even when things uh, go right and go well, 
it's helpful to have, still conduct an act after action review because you can also learn about what did we do right, not only what we did wrong. With the comfort and benefit of hindsight, when people can look back and say, oh, that will be a tremendous learning experience because you can learn from other people's mistakes as well. You know? Okay. So I just want to take you back a little bit in terms of your story about John Wilson. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, that's lesson number two. Don't be afraid of making mistakes because they're necessary for growth. The question I have in my head is that this is so much easier said, said than done, especially for those people who have never really pushed outside of their comfort zones. So for someone who was a bit of a perfectionist, this fear of failure is absolutely crippling. How did you get over that initial mindset? When you started your career, you're afraid to make mistakes. How do you go from someone who was afraid to make mistakes to someone who's open to learning? Um, how do you overcome that mental barrier? I learned this uh, lesson very early on in my career. I was just starting out and I was fortunate that somebody like John Wilson was there and he had the uh, wisdom and foresight to say those words to me. If I were to imagine myself in his shoes, he may have thought, look, you know, this young fellow Bang came to see me in this office and he probably is feeling very bad about it. If I were to reprimand him for that costly mistake without saying something to encourage him, I could destroy him, you know, <laughs> as a person, you know, not just his, his, his ability to function as a project engineer. I, I think the ability to, to learn and reflect is, is very important because you're never too old to learn. And there's always something you can learn mm -hmm. beyond formal education. Experience is a great teacher, yeah. but only if you reflect on it, just Having that experience is not enough. You need to process it and, <laughs> and make sure that it, it really makes sense to you uh, so that you, you can internalize it, so that you can externalize it later on in terms of what you have learned and, and don't repeat that mistake. You know? <laughs> For those of us that weren't fortunate enough to have a leader like John Wilson in our lives that encourages us to make mistakes and learn from it, um, it's important to know or, or understand that mistakes can be a blessing, but especially earlier on in your career, if you can use that to break out of that comfort zone or that need for perfectionism. And hopefully through the people listening to this podcast, if you don't have a leader like John Wilson in your life, hopefully listening to this podcast can let you think about how you can move on from that need to be perfect all the time and embrace the mistakes, which is actually a great segue to lesson number three. Uh, there's always something you can learn. So tell us about that. Yes, I've already mentioned about the learning and reflecting. You know, um, experience is a great teacher, uh, only if you reflect on it. And, and, and so I, I suppose that leads me to the point that it's not just learning. It's not just knowledge that I'm talking about. I'm, I'm talking about seeking wisdom. Knowledge in itself and understanding in itself is only part of the way that um, if you don't have the wisdom to apply that, that would also be counterproductive. I think it was Winston Churchill who said this, that those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. You know, we might think we are unique and we are brilliant, uh, but there are many others that have gone on before us. They have already made those mistakes. You can learn from other people's mistakes. There's really nothing new under the sun. That leads me to the other point where wise King Solomon said this, I'm sharp and tired. He also said, fools despise wisdom and instruction. So we can always learn from other people and gain wisdom. Mm. And, and, and so this principle re applies to every relationship that we have, you know, whether it's in work or, or just in life, even in marriage, I can learn lots from my wife. And I've learned to be willing to be corrected by other people as well. That's what it means by iron sharpening iron. Two hard surfaces coming together in conflict results in a sharper blade, right? You mm. sharpen yourself when you are prepared to learn from one another. So as, as a leader, I would always apply this principle to myself first, to challenge myself, and then to be prepared to challenge other people as well. So that's what I mean by saying that you can always learn from experience from history, from other people. 
Absolutely. And so it sounds to me like when you see someone who is quality, who has wisdom, who has character, rather than be intimidated and run away from them, you should be running towards them. Embrace the, the, the opportunity to be challenged in your thinking because that will make you a, a, a wiser person as a result, which is a great point. Um, now that brings us to lesson number four, know who to trust without counsel plans fail. What do you mean by that? That's a very important point which you've made. Um, you know, how can we learn from other people? Because sometimes you can learn bad things from the wrong people, right? If you keep the wrong company, ultimately you become like them. So being circumspect, being discerning and in, in, in choosing who you seek advice from is, uh, I think, a very important thing. But the first point is, is really that we, we, we need to be able to keep an eye out for, for people who can help us and can give us good advice. That's a problem that says, without counsel, plans fail. But with many advices, they succeed. And one of the reasons I, I think it's because we all have blind spots, you know, I can see you, I can see the screen, but I can't see what's behind me, or I can't see things that are on both sides of me at this time when I'm looking at you, you know? So who can see those blind spots? Sometimes other people who come alongside you or you invite to come alongside you, when you share your challenge with them, the, the issue you're dealing with, sometimes they can offer you a, a different perspective, you know, having these wise and trusted advisors opens your perspective up. You can see uh, beyond your own blind spots because we all have personal biases and sometimes we can have wrong presuppositions that lead to faulty decisions. So being able to discern our blind spots and, and welcome these other perspectives helps us to, uh, consider more factors before we face any big decision. And having these trusted advices is not just a question of just going to them when you have a problem. <laughs> yes, there, there may be some who will be willing to help at that point in time, but you need to cultivate them as well, you know? Cultivate friendships with people that you can relate to, you respect, that you can trust, who you believe has some wisdom. I, and I'm not talking of doing it in a selfish way just for myself to be able to glean advice from them, but because you appreciate them and you want to truly go through life with them. I, I think mm -hmm. we, we're talking of having not just one trusted advisor, but a, a few, you know, a yeah. few buddies that, that maybe could be older than you, mm. or they could be younger than you, or could be married to you, right? <laughs> you know? right. Uh, having a trusted advisor that you can just call mm. or WhatsApp you know, in today's world. And, and be able to just talk through things helps a great deal. And it also kind of reminds me of a couple of other people that have really helped me. One of them, I'll just call him JBK, all right? Uh, because he's got a, a long day. And uh, he's younger than me, but a very wise leader. And he taught me, never make a big decision under stress. Calm down, take a walk. You know, outdoors, if possible, maybe find a tree in the shade and sit down in the shade and, and reflect before deciding. Because rushing a decision means you, you won't have the opportunity to discern and reflect carefully, especially if it's a big decision, you know? Uh, so that was very helpful advice in an emergency, in a crisis, you've been forced to make a decision. I mean, this is kind of the opposite of what I was trying to say earlier on. Don't let the fear of mistakes paralyze you from making a decision and to be decisive. But here I'm saying, you know, depending on the type of decisions you're, you're faced with, don't jump into a, a decision that have, have massive consequences, you know, especially if you get it wrong, um, reflect and think about it. And so that leads me to the the other person who, who has given me some really invaluable advice. And I'm speaking of my, the, the minister in our church uh, at that time. His name is Simon Manchester. And he gave me this decision-making frame. Right? So I'll refer it today as, as Simon's four C's, which is discerning important decisions. And the four C's are, number one, consider your circumstances. 
Second, whether you have the capability to do it. And third, seek the counsel, wise counsel, which we we're talking about here. And only fourthly, when you reach a, a point where you have strong conviction, this is the right decision and move forward, you know. So I, I found these uh, Simon's Four C's very helpful and I've, I've applied it a few times now in my life, you know, especially for life decisions, whether you want to make this change, move country, take on a new responsibility or any big decision, discerning through this framework of, of four C's is, is very helpful. That's a great, great model. Circumstance, capability, counsel, and then conviction. Thanks for sharing that. Let's move on to lesson number five. Change is inevitable. Understand it, embrace it, and manage it. Now, we all know there's bound to be changes in our life. So what's your approach to change? In my school days, I was very, very active in, in the Boy Scouts. I was a Boy Scout leader. And I, I suppose maybe that's, that's kind of where I learned leadership. I, I was uh, responsible for a very big Boy Scout troop which included a number of other leaders as well. And there's a Boy Scout motto. I'm sure some of your listeners who, 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 who are familiar with the, the scouting movement uh, would know that Lord Baden Powell, the founder, had this motto for Boy Scouts. And it's just simply two words, be prepared. Mm. <laughs> be prepared. Be prepared for the unexpected circumstance. Be prepared to, to, to respond. When you go on a long uh, a hike, through the, the jungles, be prepared to get lost and, and survive. So being prepared means anticipating and expecting that the, the unexpected. Being prepared is, is also an attitude of mind um, to cope with change. We all know that change is inevitable. I have five grandchildren now and I look at them, how quickly they change, especially in those young little ages, when they start to crawl and they start to to talk and they start to run or oh, we can't even catch up with them, you know, <laughs> and, and they start to play tricks and they start to get naughty. And I mean, that's all change, right? And in, in life and work and everything, there, there's always change happening. Just as the fear of mistakes can really stop us from making decisions, fear of change can also be just as debilitating and, 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 and paralyzing. So really recognizing that change is inevitable and that you can prepare for change and you can respond um, positively to the change because sometimes the change in itself can uh, lead to better outcomes or, or better circumstances in the future. This whole idea of growing up, getting growing wiser and, 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 and stronger and, and more capable, those are all very positive changes in our lives. Right. The point here then is, is to look at change with the lens that you can really uh, harness the change for something better. Mm. That, that's what I mean by not only understanding it and embracing it, but to manage it, but to allow the change or to, to manage it in such a way that it leads to some positive transformation. Of course, it starts from overcoming the fear of change in the first place and then be prepared for it and then managing it so that it actually leads to something better. There's also another related point here. When I think I have the greatest idea in the world, and if somebody in my team or from somebody that I, I meet comes up with a better idea, am I going to defend my idea and, and fight back and refuse to accept the better idea or should I embrace it? I should be adaptable enough and, and humble enough to know that even though I thought I had the best idea, somebody else has a better idea. So let's embrace it and let's take it on board and, and move on with that, you know? So being prepared to change yourself is also an important aspect of this. And, and of course, the, I mentioned earlier on about, about dealing with challenges and crisis, and I'm reminded of Murphy's Law. So you've, you've heard of Murphy's Law, right? Uh, and, and Murphy's Law is... Anything that could go wrong will go wrong. Yes, exactly. You know, so that's life, right? And, and so that's why you know, we, we need to do some contingency planning, you know, have the plan in the lower drawer that you can pull out if you need to. That way you, you can be prepared for the worst 
while you're striving for the best outcome, you know? And that's how you can develop agility and adaptability. And, and, then, and those are, I think, very important aspects of life and in leadership. I've learned to, to really welcome change in my life. I've really done a lot of interesting things because I, I've, I've approached it with this kind of attitude. Having a, a positive attitude when you're faced with change, I think helps a great deal. Well said. So lesson number six, I like this one because I, I deeply believe in this. You can buy talent, but you can't buy integrity. Yes, there's a, a backstory to this. I had over 40 years of, of work experience. I, I think the vast majority has been in Asia. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I struggled for many years with the kind of corruption that I, I see there, you know, um, and it, it really challenged my faith challenged me as a personally, when you're trying to do business and, and inevitably you, you encounter these kind of situations. And I, I, I really looked at how, how people got into trouble, how organizations got into trouble. I, I saw how wonderful people have their lives destroyed because they allow the bad influences to, to corrupt them and have their marriages destroyed and their lives destroyed uh, because of that. And so when I left the corporate world and went back to school, so to speak, at the age of 50 years old, I went back to study at Regent College in Vancouver, I wanted to kind of process this, you know, theologically and personally. And so I wrote a thesis and my master's degree there was uh, really partly based on a thesis that I had uh, written there. And the thesis is uh, entitled The Practice of Integrity and in Leadership. I explore uh, the concept of integrity biblically and from the viewpoint of ethics, as in general ethics and philosophical ethics and biblical ethics. And, and I looked at triangulating a lot of that. Study two CEOs who were quite well known at that time. And both of them claimed to be practicing Christians. One uh, fell very badly and his company was destroyed and the other one thrived. It was over a period of about one and a half years that I wrote this thesis. Uh, a lot of research and interviews and talking to a lot of people. I concluded that the essential difference was not just the claim of integrity, but the practice of integrity that made the difference. It's not just about what they claim to be their core values. In fact, both organizations had similar sounding core value statements. Mm -hmm. You know, if you check their websites, they would say almost the same thing. But the difference between the two was one was just, you know, in a sense, paying lip service to it. It looked good on the outside, but inside was, was all corrupted to the core. But in the other one, the, the focus was on walking the talk. And there's a book written about the one that fell. It's entitled The Smartest Guys in the Room. And I'm speaking about Enron and Kenneth Lay, who was the CEO of that. He employed the smartest people you can get from around the world, you know, the um, Ivy League MBAs, the top business schools, and uh, the smartest people you can find, you know, from the top consulting firms in the world and all that. But when you don't practice, the ethics, uh, the morality that you claim, uh, that you profess, things can go wrong very badly. They were manipulating the energy markets and everything came tumbling down, right? So walking the talk, there's no substitute, I concluded, for uncompromising integrity, especially in leadership, because a lot rests on leadership and having that quality of uncompromising integrity, I think it's for me, a, a valuable leadership trait to look for, you know, it's about the character of the, the leader that is important. So how, how do you know someone has integrity? You look for tangible evidence of that, you know, uh, and, and that's the number one character trait that I look for when I'm interviewing, when I've done a lot of uh, leadership interviews, uh, recruiting. And I, I, I look at, you know, you, you can triangulate. I mean, you can ask people to talk about what, what is, they hold dear to their heart. What, what are the values through a series of questions? And you ask them to, ex, you know, explain their experiences, right? And you look for the evidence of consistency. 
You know, you look for the evidence of sincerity. You, you, you look for the evidence of authenticity. You look for, you know, evidence where they've actually been true to their word. Mm. Or for me, I think the preparedness to admit that they made mistakes or even being prepared to make a big decisions to say no, because it's crossed the line. Those, those things I, I hold as being valuable clues as to a person's uh, practice of integrity. My important positions that I'm recruiting for, I would look not only at, at references that the recruiter collects. Sometimes I ask to speak to the person that is giving the reference, you know, so you can probe a little bit further and, and ask about circumstances or experiences where there has been any inconsistency, especially between what we're talking about here, somebody which is, who is all talk, but without the walk, th those are warning signals. I, I rejected very capable, very, very smart people because I felt that maybe if things go wrong, am I going to be able to trust them? You know, I mean, integrity is about trust, right? When you can't trust somebody in leadership, where do you go? What happens? I mean, a lot rests on the shoulders of leaders. If you can be trusted with little things, you'll be rewarded with trust for bigger things. You know, if you cannot be trusted with little things, how can you be trusted with big things? So I look for little examples. If they failed the trust in that, in a little example, how can I trust them in a big situation? You know, so, so I would always, you know, pursue integrity. And that's integrity for people that we, we recruit or, or people that we look for as potential successes or people that we want to nurture and, and mentor at work. And, and also for my personal life as well. You know, we are all fallible human beings. And so we have to watch our own thoughts, our attitudes, exercising self-control. It, it, it's the kind of things that are, you do in secret, you know, right? We think when nobody's watching. Especially when you're in leadership, you, you need to be watchful. Indeed, indeed. Lesson number seven, choose and follow a reliable compass. And I'm guessing you don't just mean a compass that tells you the direction. Well, that's how this learning started. I was literally following a, a compass. That's one of the tools I learned in my scouting days. I could go through a virgin jungle and get to my destination. I used to go hiking with a, a machete and you would chop your way through even when there's no path, because if you have a compass, you know, you're heading in the right direction. So I, I am talking about a real compass that tells you where it's true north. If you want to go north or east, you need to head in that direction and you just keep going and you get there. So that was very helpful when I was living in the UK and I, I lived in the Midlands mainly and, and Whenever I used to go to London, and in those days, there was no GPS, there was no mobile phone, and all we had were those printed maps of London, road maps, and it's not easy to drive. In fact, it's illegal to drive holding a road map in front of you, right? But I knew how to follow a compass. So I actually bought a compass and stuck it on my windscreen. And just by following the compass, I never got lost in London. And having that right compass made sure that I never took the wrong path and got lost. And, and, and it's a bit like that in life and, and work and leadership. If you follow the wrong compass, you can go the wrong way and you can get lost. And, and especially when you're a leader, our leadership decisions can have some big consequences. And, and sometimes some leadership uh, decisions can have moral consequences. So that kind of leads me to the, the, the question, do good ends justify bad means? I think there is a, a danger in having an attitude that in leadership, sometimes you need to do whatever it takes just to get to that point that you need to get to, just to get the necessary result. You will do anything and compromise everything. No, I think, well, firstly, uh, my faith guides me. And secondly, my experience guides me as well, that, um, if you make compromises along the way, especially I uh, uh, meet ethical compromises, you end up with something worse. So, so having uh, a clear guide 
kind of a moral guide, an ethical guide, that compass helps guide me in my decision making. Is it going to have a better outcome for greater good? The way I'm going to do it, is it going to cause other people to do the wrong things? The means or the approach that I'm going to take, is it going to really be illegal? There's always a temptation to cheat or to lie or to take the shortcut that tramples on a lot of other people or, 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 or to climb up the ladder by pushing other people down. There's, there's all kinds of, of, of considerations in this. And having that compass to guide us, to make sure that we, we, we don't make a decision that you'll uh, regret later on in life. I guess this is a thing that you probably accumulated over the years, right? How do you know that your compass is pointing to true north? And what I mean by that is, how do you know that your moral compass is well aligned? How do you know you're doing the right thing? Well, how do you know that the compass that you buy is actually pointing in the right direction? You, you, you compare it with another compass or a few more compasses and you kind of check it against others, right? Mm. In other words, you, you have a, a tried and tested compass. Right. For me, my maker's user manual, mm. you know, is tried and tested through history, through the lives of people, through lots and lots of personal experience. So for me, I can say that my maker's manual, and I'm referring to the Bible, is an invaluable guide for my life and my work. There's a lot more to it. You know, there's a lot more beyond our present life to look forward to, according to my maker's value. So that optimism, that hope keeps me going on. It keeps me striving in, in, in terms of today, because I know that even when things go wrong here, not everything goes the way I hope it would, that ultimately all things will be made new and, and good. And, and, and if I may just add one more. Little quote. I, I, I remember this uh, from one of the professors that I had at Regent College. He, he just died, I think, last year, uh, mm. age 95 or something like that. His name is J.I. Pecker, well known Oxford theologian. He, he wrote this. He, he said, Readiness to die is the first step in living. So if we're ready to die, it helps frame our whole life, doesn't it? Right? Anticipating. That will happen one day. It, it helps us to kind of appreciate our life today. And it helps us to stay on the right path so that we will reach a, a happy death. Oh, that's very profound. You, you know, people who are afraid to die have not lived. Indeed. Moving on to lesson number eight, develop your work rest ethic. Now I've heard of the work ethic. What is the work rest ethic? Yes. Again, the, uh, the backstory is, um, I have to confess that for many years in my working life, I was a workaholic. You, you know what it's like when you're working in Asia, especially people would not want to go home because they felt like doing a good job is going home when it gets very dark, when it's late at night, people work so hard and, and so did I. There were occasions when I, I felt I was getting really close to burnout, but thankfully I didn't burn out <laughs> and wither away. Uh, I was able to bounce back and you know, you've heard the story, work hard and play hard, right? I'm sure you've heard it many times before. And that was the Enron story. You know, the smartest guys in the room, they would work hard and play hard and look where they got there. So when I left the corporate world and, and spent this wonderful years at uh, Regent College in Vancouver. It's a beautiful spot in the world. You know, I mean, Sydney is beautiful, but Vancouver is, is beautiful uh, beyond compare. We were on the campus of the University of British Columbia. It's on a peninsula. You could see the sea and snow-capped mountains in the, in the distance, you know, and it's a 20 minute drive to the ski fields from where I lived. <laughs> and we had a forest next to us and so I took time to smell the roses, so to speak, you know, as a student, I really felt that it was a kind of a sabbatical, you know, it was an opportunity to not only smell the roses, but to kind of re recreate, you know, a time of renewal. 
in, in my case, I wrote a couple of papers. One of them was a, a sabbatical paper. In my research, I, I learned that the ethic of rest is just as important as the ethic of work. It's just the way we are created. You know, the creation story, God, you know, created for six days and on the seventh day he rested. So that's why we have weekends, right? You know, we work for five or six days a week and then we rest. It's also in our daily rhythm as well. We work during the day, we play during the day, and then we rest at night, right? How many people can survive without sleep? I can't. I don't think you can. <laughs> I don't think anybody can survive without sleep. It's just the way we are wired. We're made this way. Sure. There is a, a rhythm of work and sleep, work and rest. There is a daily rhythm. There is a weekly rhythm. There is a longer term rhythm as well. That's why in, in work, we have annual leave. And I found that actually quite a number of companies had sabbatical leave as well. You know, one of the companies I worked for, Tandem Computers had sabbatical leave. After 10 years, you have sabbatical leave in Australia. There's an author, Eugene Peterson, who, who wrote that there is a kind of a daily, weekly, monthly depletion in our, our own being that cannot be revitalized in our daily rest cycles or weekly rest cycles. It's a kind of a longer term depletion. There's a decay in our energy levels. Uh, if we keep working hard and working hard, you know, and, and so that's why the longer term sabbaticals, uh, leaves and, and long service leave and all that helps us to recover. I learned from that, that there are actually a whole series of words that start with R E. So having this rest ethic includes spending time where we are spending redemptive time, rest time. You know, it's a time for renewal, time for refreshing, a time for rejuvenation. It includes recreation, playing sport and, and, and running or, or going out for walks and all that is part of our resting from work. In a sense, doing something different is also a way of refreshing ourselves. And recreation and recreation means making things new. It's when we are resting. That's when our body heals. So there's a healing and transformative aspect. And in the old days where rest from agricultural work means returning to your home village, returning and reconnecting with family, repairing or restoring relationships, forgiving one another and, and, and revitalizing connections. They're all part of the ethic of rest. It's about making things new again. And I'm talking of not just physical rest, but a rest for your mind, a mm. uh, rest for your emotions, a yeah. rest for our spirit and, and our whole being, our soul. Resting is just as important as work. I would pursue excellence when I'm working. But how many of us pursue excellence in our rest? Oh, we this so a few, isn't it? Why? And the papers that I wrote was, in a sense, quite redemptive for me too. It helped mm -hmm. me to kind of reframe my understanding of life, understand also a, a sense of timing. Mm -hmm. The time for work, there is a time for rest. And in life, you know, sometimes timing is everything. Absolutely. No, thank you very much for that. And lesson number nine, value the relationships that matters most. Yes, it's probably a lesson that people tend to learn when they get older in life, you know, and friends one by one start to die off or loved ones die off. Of course, the pandemic sadly has accelerated that those, some of those events mm. or for some people it's when you are facing the idea of leaving this life or somebody close to you that is leaving this life that you begin to appreciate how much uh, that person has meant to you. But that shouldn't be the case for, mm. for life, right? I mean, you, it shouldn't be just at the end that you appreciate somebody. You should be investing in that appreciation today. 
when you still have life ahead of you on your, your tombstone, nobody's going to write, he was a great executive, he, he made so much money and he had all these titles and, you know, you, what, what's going to matter at the end of the day, the people who you love most, right? Hmm. And for me, it's not just my wife and my children and grandchildren and my extended family, but at the center of it all, it, as the anchor of my faith is my God, my relationship with God is. It matters a lot to me and my relationship with my wife and my children and grandchildren matters a lot to me. And there are significant others as well. Earlier on, I talked about walking with brothers um, and sisters, the people that you, you appreciate and, and respect and as trusted advisors or, or people you walk the journey of life with. They're all gifts to us, right? When you appreciate the relationship, you, you want to spend some time in it, you want to invest in it, you want to develop mutual relationships where you would encourage one another, you would inspire one another, you sometimes challenge one another, you know, having life-giving relationships, I think is very helpful if we work so hard and we forget our families, you can't make up the time again, you know. I was a very hard-working father. And, and one of my regrets is that I didn't spend enough time with my children in the years when they needed me most. I was always traveling around the world and I wish I had the time, the opportunity to spend that time with them again, uh, when they're young, but I can't, it's gone. Don't let those opportunities uh, go past and have those regrets later on. But now I'm so thankful it, and in, in a sense, quite redemptive <laughs> that I'm going to spend some time with my grandchildren. In my last significant role, I, I led the World Vision operations in a couple of regions. Um, and my last region was the Middle East and Eastern Europe. And, and, and I'm talking about love, right? And as a Christian, I, I, I claim that I love God and I love people. But I was seriously challenged by my national director from Afghanistan. So Jim Alexander, I was just starting in the role and I hadn't met, I was overseeing 13 countries and, and Jim was one of my national directors that I hadn't met before. So here I was just arrived in uh, Colombia, in Bogota for a global meeting at the airport, I bumped into this person who had just arrived as well on another flight from Afghanistan and we chatted and he introduced himself and I did myself as well. And I found out he was Jim Alexander, who was going to be my national director in Afghanistan. And he asked me, why are you here? I had no experience as a humanitarian prior to this. And for some reason they put me in charge of you and the other countries like Syria and Iraq and all this. So I said simply, look, I, I believe I'm called to this role. God is calling me and I believe that this is what I'm supposed to do. And he, he said, hey, calling and obedience to God is not enough. Do you love the people? And, you know, I was going to be his boss and he was challenging me. Do you love the people? And I said, Jim, what are you talking about? Do you love the people? Of course I do. And he said, do you really love the people? And he asked me and he said, he explained, he said, look, you know, the reason we persevere and continue to work in Afghanistan, where there's so many problems. And of course now the problem's getting even harder with the Taliban taking over. And Jim said, the reason that we keep going in helping those poor people and, and suffering people in Afghanistan is because we love them. Do you love them? I said, I haven't even met them. How do I love them? How can you love the, the people that you don't even know? And it really challenged me. I, I shared it with my wife and we both went through a period of introspection where we really examine our own hearts. When we say we love God and love people, do we, they're very different people to us. Some of them can be very violent, but many of them are very, very poor and suffering. Will you love them? And he helped me to really understand what it means uh, to truly love somebody. Love means giving without expecting anything in return. And I, I have found that in, in my visits to Afghanistan, Jim's challenge really helped me. 
you know, I could approach these people who were very different from myself and from my own personal circle of friends. And, but I, mm-hmm. I really felt for that and I wanted to help them. Even though we come from a different faith, you know, they accepted me because I was speaking the language of love. All right. Thank you for that. And lesson number 10, give thanks in all circumstances. As a person of faith and a person who has seen a lot and, and received a lot, I've learned to be thankful uh, for what I have received. Mm. The Bible teaches us to rejoice always, you know, to give thanks in all circumstances because this is the will of God for you. But it's more than that. It's because it's also good for you, you know, being thankful for what we have helps me to really think about the good gifts that I have received, even when things are not going well, <laughs> appreciating the, the good things that we have received in, in life and work and you know, the good things that have happened helps me to, to, to maintain a positive attitude and, and uh, an optimistic approach to my work and, and life. We may think that we have earned everything that we have achieved and, and so on, but there's always more to it. There are some things that, that beyond us, sometimes they surprise us and, and acknowledging that we are just stewards of what we have been entrusted with. I'm a steward of my family, my wife, my children and grandchildren and, and, and so on. And at work, as I'm a leader, I'm, I'm a steward of the organization and the people and the resources that are there. And, and so an attitude of gratitude helps in wise stewardship. How best do you use or apply those resources for the greater good? Uh, but that attitude of gratitude is also very encouraging for your people as a leader. A simple thank you sometimes can go a very long way. Sincere appreciation when expressed generously is a great motivator for the team. I've learned <clears throat> as a leader. You always look out for, uh, for others to thank them. I think we are all wired that way. We work better when we are appreciated. Yeah. Giving thanks in all circumstances, you know, has been a, a tremendous uh, value to me in my life. Indeed, by, by giving thanks, what you're actually saying is that, you know, there may be things that you got that you don't deserve. It puts you in a much better mindset in order to make wiser decisions. Yes, indeed. The glass is uh, never just half empty, right? You know, it's also half full. <laughs> <laughs> you can see it one way or the other. You can approach someone and say, look, you've only done half of what you're supposed to do. You failed. Or you can say, look, you've already done half of what you're supposed to do. And let me encourage you to finish the, the other half. One is much more uplifting and motivating. And the other one can be so destroying, especially if the person has worked so hard just to get the first half done and, and to only to be told is only half full. So this is about developing wisdom. There's a, a lot of wisdom in, in looking at the glass as being half full versus half empty. Being appreciative for what has already been done sometimes so that you can motivate the completion of the rest. Indeed. And that's, those are very wise words. And with that, I'd like to thank you for spending your time with us today and sharing your 10 lessons. Yes. Uh, it's my great pleasure to have the opportunity to, to talk about this. This exercise has been very helpful for me to think these things through because sometimes you just uh, get on with life and you don't reflect enough. And so this has been very helpful for me personally as well. Thank you very much, Jen. Thank you. And we're deeply appreciative of that. And we'll finish on that note. You've been listening to the podcast, 10 Lessons It Took Me 50 Years to Learn, where we dispense wisdom for career, business, and life. Our guest today has been Ben Yeo, sharing the 10 lessons it took him 50 years to learn. This episode is produced by Robert Hossery, sponsored by the Professional Development Forum, which offers insights, community discussions, podcasts, parties, anything you want, anything you need. And the best part, it's all free. You can find them online at www.professionaldevelopmentforum.org. Don't forget to leave us a review or comment. You can even email us at podcast at 10 lessonslearnedcom That's podcast at number one zero lessonslearned.com. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button so that you don't miss an episode of the only podcast that makes the world a little wiser, lesson by lesson. Thanks for listening and stay safe, everyone.